Michelle, good morning, Oneness CSL, and all of you who are joining us from near and far. To begin, I would like to acknowledge that Columbia resides on the sacred lands of the Piscataway, and we are heart grateful. So March is here, and with it, the theme, Open to Possibilities. Oh, I love this topic. You know, each of us wants to move through life, don't we, with a ease and peace and joy, trusting ourselves in the decisions we make. In order to open to life's possibilities, we must increase our faithful use of the law of mind and action as our constant partner and companion. When um, our first go-to is spiritual practice, our capacity to morph and adapt to change sets a new confidence in motion and we become receptors or receptive rather than resistors of how universal good appears in our lives. Being open to possibilities is a byproduct of expanding our consciousness of acceptance. So I'd like to begin today in exploring the idea of include and transcend as the highest use of this spiritual law or law of mind in action. You know, as a longtime student of life and living in a spiritual way, I love how our teaching, the science of mind and spirit, leads us to the deeper questions that many new or seasoned have found so challenging to move through. It has been my personal experience, which I know is common among us, that we are not well practiced in the art of dissolving our defenses, accepting vulnerability as a way to strengthen our guiding light, or generally just letting it be okay for people to see us. Mm. Even though we say mm, we want to be seen and heard. The layers do go deep. And let's face it, you know, transparency is not humanity's forte. Long before I was called to be a minister, I was called to be a clown. Yes, the red nose of a clown. You know, neither experience was pre-planned or thought through, but simply the result of having said yes to divine intervention. Be it known that the principle of wholeness is expressed in all of life's seeming paradox, disguised as the concept of opposition, when spiritually speaking, it is nothing more or less than the sacred complement or two sides of the same coin. Now this healing awareness can be more easily absorbed when we bridge science and spirituality with you know, a sense of playfulness, lightness, humor. The artful process I continue to move in is to reframe my perceived shortcomings, to embrace my foibles and even transmute pain, giving them the sacred recognition of their humanity as being a divine expression. Include and transcend the highest use of spiritual law. Now, the concept is more widely known as transcend and include. And is how many spiritual teachings and the science of mind is interpreted at least in one's initial understanding of its practice. <sighs> Knowing that our true spiritual nature and individualized expression of the one life, one God, so that we can learn to love the self is where we, we, we begin from. We use a method of affirmative prayer work and we call that method spiritual mind treatment as a way in which we speak our word to lean us into a greater realm of possibility in our own life based upon what we have chosen to identify as the universal creative process, always demonstrating to move cause into effect or energy into matter. We begin with recognition. Now this, this spiritual mind treatment is done in five steps and the first of which is called recognition. And recognition means um, all, all is God, all is divine presence, infinite intelligence, 
And we know that as goodness, excuse me, goodness and wholeness and unity. We know it as complete and perfect in its nature. And then, because it is all there is in step two, we bring ourselves into the mix and unify with it. Now, here's where the formula can take a left turn. Mostly because as soon as we use the word I and individualize the one, our mind, our memories, our subconscious belief patterns tend to kick in and respond in a secondary conversation in our, our heads as our mouths are moving in a completely opposite direction. Like, are you kidding me? <laughs> God, the almighty and I are one and the same. Wow. Now that's a pretty big frog to swallow. And that doesn't matter if you're new to metaphysics or you've been in it a long time. You know, it breaks down here because our ego surfaces and we think in terms of personality, individuality, and objectivity. This is true much of the time, unless we stay with the feeling sense of the energy or frequency we are creating, or that is being co-created through the placement of our intention. Now, if we successfully carry that expansive energy of unlimited possibility of life and make it through the second step of unification, then we are better poised to declare the truth of our being and of the condition of our lives or not. Now it can become progressively harder. That is why we call it spiritual practice to bring an on the ground feeling experience when we, our emotion is filled with confusion, chaos, desire, um, anger, or attachment. It is hard to bring that feeling up into the same energetic frequency of trust, faith, joy, unity. So then for most, if we're honest, especially when we're beginning to learn and practice spiritual mind treatment, we can hit a wall. And we just want to see those last two steps, gratitude and release quickly and release the pressure of saying one thing and thinking another. Does this sound a little familiar? Because that is what a lot of us um, do in our daily communication. So I believe after 25 years in this teaching that we still need to practice treatment all the time, our affirmative prayer, pray unceasingly. And at the same time, practice not letting our focus on the third dimension reality keep us separated from the unified field where all already exists. In other words, include first the seeming paradox. Include first the seeming paradox in our perception, decisions, and actions. Then, transcendence because of, becomes an automatic feeling state. Jung said that emotion is the chief source of becoming conscious. Without it, there can be no transforming of dark into light or apathy into movement. So we need to get beyond ourselves living in the energy of the unified field, accepting the emotional feeling and expression of the shadow. So how do we divert, how do we do this? I think, you know, for me, I've had to divert my brain instead of killing the pain. So Holmes says, turn away from the condition. And when we're thinking too hard and trying too hard to focus on something and our feelings are feeling incongruent with this new focus, it's very difficult. That's why we do treatment to start shifting to start shifting our focus towards the truth and um, engendering the feeling of that unification and that recognition that there is only one. But I'll tell you, that was, uh, that was not my first learning step. My first learning step was through laughter and play and irreverence and silliness and being the fool. I had to drop into that place of, of what was one of my greatest fears, 
which was looking silly or stupid. And then ultimately the use of spiritual law or the recognition of spiritual laws always working in my life and aligning with them became easier. Now, Dr. Holmes wrote a book uh, entitled Open at the Top. And I love this book because to me, it references that there is no precedent in principle. So that principle, meaning the infinite mind, um, the infinite field of possibility is always present in the now moment. And so anything that has gone before cannot set a precedent in our thinking newly, unless of course we focus on what was before. He also says, and this is for me as a, a young student um, in, in his science of mind text, basically, and I'm paraphrasing, we are not here to leave a legacy or even to make a difference, but to be the full expression of what we came here to be. Obviously, we need to be open to possibilities. We need to trust ourselves. Actually, we will do almost anything to survive in a complex societal structure. So we need to trust ourselves. You know that wonderful saying, be in this world, but not of it? You know, when I first heard that, I was very interested in being not of this world. I would do anything to sit on the outside looking in so that I could witness it and make a very educated and informed decision when I wanted to step in. And what was that based on? My fear of not being safe. My perception that there were more differences in us in a, as a human race than there were commonalities. And deeper down, what was the real root cause of that? was because I was divided within myself or against myself. I did not embrace my humanity. Therefore, I could not embrace the humanity and what the humanity might be doing at any given time. And so what I started to learn to do through clowning was not to self-improve, but just to self-approve by being true and authentic to how I felt and the expression of those feelings in the moment. And this really taught me and trained me over these 20 years to be present and think and uh, be in the and both world rather than the either or or me you world. One of the things um, I know as a spiritual student is that I must keep asking the question, what is my impact? on the rise and fall of the collective consciousness. And Holmes tells us that there's a power for good in the universe and we can use it. So when we use thought and are not possessed by thought, the deep destruction and distraction of the labels and self-identification that we bring upon ourselves begins to unravel and loosen. And when that happens, we are open to more possibilities. You know, I am a religious scientist because I can be all of who I am without apology, knowing that God is living in through and as me. I am committed to live into these principles because it guides me to experience my true nature and the promise or natural outcome of God as the universal creative process and not just taste for him, but be free. You know, to be honest, when others ask me what religion I minister to, I sometimes say, you know, just to lighten things up, I guess, and be a bit of a brat, that I teach the religion of more. I know a lot of people in our community say, I don't know how to explain to people our belief system. Well, and that is a, a, a good conversation. But for me, sometimes I say, I teach the religion of more. Um, more to be, more to experience, more to share, but not more to know. And in my books, it all begins with more to feel. And more about that in a moment. Truthfully, I am a religious scientist because when I live into the principle of unity, wholeness, and oneness, 
perfect God, perfect life, perfect man. And I choose to align my thinking and actions with natural spiritual laws, such as cause and effect, attraction, reciprocity. I get to live in the result instead of hanging out in the idea. So back to uh, the religion of feeling more. It's a challenge for many, but in order to be in the world and love it, rather than be in the world, but not of it, separation is once again implied, at least when you are learning the fine art of embracing the paradox. To believe and dance in the principle of wholeness on both a universal and personal level. We can't learn to be not of this world until we have mastered being in this world. And we can't master being in this world until we embrace, accept, have compassion, love ourselves, our humanity, all humanity. We certainly need a strong back and a very soft front if we are to be in the world and love it and share a sacred space between life and death with others and be here dancing to that music in between the notes on the conscious journey of our own becoming, the natural evolution of consciousness. I love Zen teaching stories. Um, and there's one about um, a, a Zen meditation student living in an enclosed, uh, an enclosure rather, which was perched above the Dead Sea. And there he was listening to the wind in the olive trees. As he climbed to the rooftop of his zendo, he could see the huge sun emerge from the Dead Sea beyond the desert of Judas. And his Zen master said, you see, oh, live, olive, oh, live and dead from the same place. Now the olive tree illustrates that even when the fruits fall away, the roots are still growing deeper and stronger. To ancient Greeks, the olive was the mythological tree sacred to Athena, the protectress of wisdom. In the Middle East, the olive is a, a religious and secular symbol of peace, uh, wealth, and abiding goodness. Though like the uncured fruit of the olive itself, this peace is not without its own bitterness. 70 years after the death of Christ, Roman soldiers slashed down the olives of the Garden of Gethsemane, while modern inhabitants of Israel have uprooted thousands of fruiting olive trees, which is the plant of blessing for Islam, relied on for centuries to mark the boundaries of Palestinian land. The olive tree matures slowly over time, yet can remain fruitful for more than 700 years. Apparently, the olive has the uncanny ability to renew itself from destruction and decay for long after an individual tree dies. I don't know if you knew this, I certainly didn't, but the plant's massive root ball continues to pump with life, throwing out new shoots for several centuries. They need scant water to get established yet. Its hidden roots seek out moisture to a depth of 20 feet. The fruits taste is strong. It's as old as water and just as deep. War and peace on the tongue, all live and dead from the same source. Now many are suffering from a case of mistaken identity. So where to begin on the journey to embrace the principle of wholeness operating as our humanity? Well, for me, the first thing is to be honest. And don't let the excuse of fear stop us from not creating an identity or image, but rather take an awesome journey of discovering yourself, who we truly are, that can feel a bit different. Um, let me say more simply, our journey isn't about being successful at creating ourselves. It's about the discovery of who we have always been. To seek our true self is an exercise of the intellect, 
to be our true self in it is an exercise of the heart in which infinite intelligence has its home. Um, I have learned to identify myself with the feeling sense in my inner body and, and in that move away from the many swirling ideas I have of the self or the I. I've also learned to be very observant to watch to see if I'm being congruent um, with my intentions uh, and my values. And I've learned that if I'm not, then I will reveal my covert intentions. So if I'm not living a value-based life, I, I do see where I'm incongruent with my intentions and my decisions. You know, we always say it's kind of not how you show up as much as it is what, the, what is the intention be behind how you show up. Sometimes when we're incongruent, we can discover that we're carrying um, a conscious intention to succeed and an unconscious intention to fail. So we need to reframe, sorry, reframe that idea of failure. I'm gonna I'm gonna share a fun example of my clowning days to demonstrate that you know you don't have to be uh, particularly skilled when you start learning to be a clown at what you do with regards to using props or creating an act or a skit. Our true challenge uh, is to tell a story with whatever we do that's authentic, that will capture uh, our audience and draw them in subjectively. They must believe you. For example, when I started learning juggling, now I'm not all that coordinated. Um, and so rather than getting the skill of juggling perfect, I decided that, hey, I'm supposed to be funny. I'm supposed to be kind of klutzy and goofy as a clown. So I ended up showing my audience my attempts at juggling, my concerns, my frustrations, my amusement, all as I was feeling it as I was trying to juggle. See, you're, you're trying to create an authentic story in performance. Who cares if you can really juggle? And I started to book myself as a clown with a juggling act, and I never in 20 years could juggle more than three balls. Listen, we make it up. We decide what to think. We're always making it up. I want to ask you a question. How many of you are familiar with these myths? Pennies don't fall from heaven. Everything has a price. You must follow the rules to fit in. When you don't think of others first, you are selfish. And how many are familiar with these myths? Honor thyself first. Follow your bliss. The highest and best for me is the highest and best for all concern, no matter what it looks like. Now, which one... Which grouping brings you a sense of aliveness? And which one do you ascribe to in your daily life? And the last thing I do to begin learning to embrace my identity is use my imagination because imagination is what will move us from precedence to originality. There are indeed risks to living on the edge or in the mystery without being in control of every situation. But the ultimate goal of life is not that we shall arrive at a spiritual destination where everything remains static and inactive. Life is an eternal upward spiral of existence. And crossing the great divide from the relativity of day-to-day -day life to the marriage of our souls to their source is where imagination is vital. Mm, far too often, our tendency around our own personal evolution and helping to create a world that works for everyone is to transcend first. And I think that excludes. And transcending, having that very spiritual way about you as an identity that you're seeking can often make us sound superior rather than inclusive, which in turn makes us neither. Hmm. It's important for us to always keep in mind that our words are not absolute truth. 
They are teaching tools we use to try and better understand our reality. In the old Zen tradition, they say our words are but the finger pointing to the moon. Let us not get caught up in the finger that we miss the moon to which it is pointing. The highest use of a mental practice is to listen to our inner voice and to declare its presence by being one with our feeling, our emotion, and be true in that moment to its expression. We are not here to analyze or understand what is being. We are here to experience and share the greatest expression of ourselves possible in an infinite field of possibility. As a metaphysician, we need to not want to change everything, but to realize instead the good in all things. Moving from a perception of duality to a perception of oneness is to realize a universal order and that there's nothing to be fixed outside or inside of one's experience or expression of this life. So join with me in knowing that to live the awareness of that one we do accept and we do not want to change the unique individualization of the one that we are, knowing that God fills every void, that God guides and leads us in a perfect way to the next step of being our self, knowing that there is no separation between the holy, sacred one, the holiness and sacredness of life, and the holiness and sacredness of each individualized expression, the me, the self, to include and transcend the highest use of spiritual law is who we are, is where we are, and what we choose. Life is a blessing, and so are we, and so it is. Amen.